In this first talk, I outline the view of Marcus's overall aims given in full in a forthcoming book, Marcus Aurelius Meditations 1 to 6, translated with an introduction and commentary, Oxford University Press. I've given a shorter treatment in the introduction to the 2011 World's Classics edition I prepared with Robin Hard. I begin by placing my approach in a broader scholarly context. In earlier treatments, it was quite common to present Marcus as very much an amateur in Stoicism or as an eclectic, someone who combined Stoic ideas with those of other theories. Some scholars have thought the meditations were a literary rather than philosophical exercise and that Stoicism was more like a religion than a philosophy for him. More recently, however, scholars have tended to take Marcus much more seriously as a Stoic thinker. At the same time, they've suggested that to make proper sense of the meditations, we need to take account of his specific objectives and the standpoint from which he approaches Stoic ideas. If we do so, we can gauge more effectively the full extent of his understanding of Stoic ideas and also explain the relatively small number of seemingly non-Stoic features of his thought. This is the approach taken in, for instance, Pierre Hadot's Influential Readings of the Meditations in Philosophy as a Way of Life, 1995, and The Inner Citadel, 1998. Also in John Sellers' The Art of Living, The Stoics on the Nature and Function of Philosophy, 2003. It's also the view taken in two other books, Angelo Giovato, Interlocutore di Stesso, La Dialettica di Marco Aurelio, 2008, and Marcel van Ackeren's two-volume study, Di Philosophy Marc Aurels, 2011, as well as in my own writings on Marcus. What was Marcus trying to do in the Meditations? What follows is my own view, but partly shared by these other recent studies. The Meditations is not a unified or systematic theoretical text. It consists of about 500 entries of varying lengths with no obvious principles of organisation, apart from the exceptional Book One. It seems to be a philosophical notebook in which the 2nd century AD Emperor noted down his reflections at the beginning or end of the working day. His aim, broadly speaking, is clear enough, I think. It is to sum up, in concise, powerful, often imagistic language, key principles of Stoic philosophy that can provide a strong ethical foundation for shaping his life. He states this aim more or less in these terms in one of the longer entries or chapters in the Meditations. People look for retreats for themselves in the country, by the coast or in the hills and you too are especially inclined to feel this desire. But this is altogether unphilosophical when it's possible for you to retreat into yourself at any time you want. There is nowhere that a person can find a more peaceful and trouble-free retreat than in his own mind, especially if he has within himself the kind of thoughts that let him dip into them and so at once gain complete ease of mind. And by ease of mind, I mean nothing but having one's own mind in good order. So, constantly give yourself this retreat and renew yourself. And here are some especially important words you should have to hand concise and fundamental principles which will be enough as soon as you encounter them to cleanse you from all distress and send you back without resentment at the activities to which you will return. Each of the entries in the meditations represents a selection of these concise and fundamental stoic principles which can sustain him in his life. More generally, I think we can characterise the overall aim of the work in the following terms. What we find are repeated attempts to encapsulate in a few highly charged sentences 
the broad vision of human life and its cosmic setting offered by Stoicism. The work communicates with remarkable power what it means to try and live one's life sincerely and urgently according to Stoic principles. At the heart of the meditations is an idea central to Stoic ethics. This is that, over and above the biological and purely formal dimensions of our existence, we should shape our lives as an ongoing journey towards an ideal state of character, understanding and mode of interpersonal relationship, which should constitute our target, even though we will never achieve it fully. In the light of this core project, Marcus addresses challenges of which he is especially conscious, but which are also universal human concerns. These are facing the looming presence of our own death and recognising the significance of our communal roles and personal relationships, in spite of our shared mortality and transience. Marcus also addresses in his own distinctive way broader topics on the interface between ethics and logic or physics that were crucial for Stoicism. He looks for reassurance, despite some uncertainties, that the capacities of human psychology and the nature of the universe support the kind of ethical vision that Stoicism offers. The meditations are not systematic in their organisation or expression. But I think we can isolate four main recurrent strands in the thought of the work, which are closely interconnected and which are combined in the short entries of the meditations. The first strand is the idea that we should shape our lives as an ongoing journey towards an ideal state of character and understanding and mode of interpersonal relationship, the idea I've just summed up. This idea derives from certain well-marked features of Stoic ethics, above all, the theory of ethical development as appropriation or familiarisation, oikaiosis. The meditations repeatedly evoke key features of this theory in its personal and social dimensions and in the interplay between them. The first strand forms the main underpinning framework for the work, with the other three strands deriving from the first one. The second strand consists of a set of interrelated themes. These include death as a looming and inevitable presence, human and sometimes cosmic transience, and the physical dimension of human existence. The common element in these is that they are all unavoidable aspects of our human lives, which fall outside the scope of human agency, and thus outside the project of ethical aspiration and development that forms the first strand. However, the two strands are closely connected in that adopting the appropriate attitude to such facts as death, seeing them as matters of indifference, as the Stoics put it, forms an integral part of the process of ethical development that is central to the first strand. The third and fourth strands represent ways in which Marcus explores the interface between ethics and logic and, more importantly, physics or the study of nature. Marcus is especially concerned with two ideas. One, the third strand, is that the distinctive features of human or rational psychology make us uniquely capable of undertaking the project of ongoing ethical development that makes up the first strand. The fourth strand broadens the scope of the meditations to the natural universe as a whole. The crucial idea is that the universe forms an ordered, rational, providential framework for the project of ongoing ethical development that Marcus urges on himself. In this sense, he, like all other human beings, forms an integral part of a larger, informing whole. 
There are certain seemingly puzzling ways in which Marcus formulates aspects of both these strands, discussed briefly later, that I think the puzzle diminishes if we bear in mind his core project. This general description of his project may help to make sense of Marcus's aims in the meditations. But how closely does the project depend on key distinctive features of Stoic philosophy? I think that in spite of the non-technical style of the work, most of the main recurrent ideas do reflect core themes of Stoic philosophy, especially in ethics and also on the interface of ethics and logic or dialectic and physics, the study of nature. Just to list a few of the more important Stoic themes in the meditations. One is the idea that virtue is the only really good thing in human life and that other so-called good things such as health and wealth are what they call matters of indifference. Secondly, the idea that all human beings are fundamentally capable of developing to the point where they recognise that virtue is the only good. An idea which is central to the personal strand in the distinctive Stoic theory of ethical development conceived as appropriation or familiarisation, oikeousis. Thirdly, the idea that our shared possession of reason makes all human beings an integral part of a single brotherhood. Development towards understanding this fully forms the second social strand in the Stoic theory of oikeosis. Fourthly, the idea that reason, a shared distinctively human feature, can mould our emotions and desires completely over time in a way that frees us from irrational passions such as ambition and the fear of death. And finally, the idea that exercising human reason in this way also constitutes bringing ourselves in line with the rationality and providential care that is built into the universe as a whole and that forms its inbuilt divinity. The meditations allude again and again to these and other absolutely central Stoic ideas. Of special importance is the idea of development as appropriation, because this makes sense of Marcus's whole project in the work. He writes each day to help himself take forward the lifelong journey of ethical development, which he knows will be incomplete at death, but will help him prepare appropriately for this event, by recognising that death is relatively a matter of indifference. Let me look briefly at one passage which brings together a number of these themes. To the preceding pieces of advice, one more should be added. Always make a definition or delineation of whatever presents itself to your mind, so that you can see it distinctively what sort of thing it is when stripped down to its essence as a whole and in all its parts. And tell yourself its proper name and the name of the elements from which it has been put together and into which it will be dissolved. Nothing is so effective in creating greatness of mind as being able to examine methodically and truthfully everything that presents itself in life and always viewing things in such a way as to consider what kind of function this particular thing contributes to what kind of universe, and what value it has for the whole universe and for the human beings who are citizens of the highest city, of which the other cities are, as it were, mere households. And what this object is that presently makes an impression on me, and what it is composed of, and how long in the nature of things it will persist, and what virtue is needed to respond to it, such as gentleness, truthfulness, good faith, simplicity, self-sufficiency, and so on. So, in each case, you should say, this has come from God, this from the coordination and interweaving 
of the threads of fate and similar kinds of coincidence and chance. This from one of my own kind, a relative and companion, but one who does not know what is natural for him. But I do know, and so I treat him kindly and justly, according to the natural law of companionship, though aiming at the same time at what he deserves with regard to the things that are morally neutral. Let me briefly highlight the themes brought together in this passage. Marcus urges himself to use an analytic or stripping method which views each situation as one that gives scope for expressing the virtues such as greatness of mind or gentleness and so on. Marcus presupposes here the personal strand in ethical development which leads to full recognition of the radical difference in value between virtues and indifference. He uses the word for indifference, mesa, uh, intermediate things in Greek, in his final words. He also assumes the social side of Stoic ethical development, which leads one to recognise that all human beings are essentially fellow citizens in the universe and relatives, even if they do not themselves recognise this fact. He also assumes the Stoic ideal that achieving the goal of human life, what they call the telos, and completing the journey of ethical development also means bringing yourself into line with the divinity and providential care that is built into the universe and the, in the interlocking nexus of events in the universe. The passage also illustrates the way that Marcus uses the meditations not just to restate what he calls concise and fundamental principles of Stoicism, uh, as he put it in 4.3, the passage I cited earlier, he also shows how bringing these themes together can show their mutual relevance and interconnections. Bringing these ideas together makes more sense of them as doctrines, as teachings. But it also helps to show how they can form a coherent framework for trying to lead a good human life. And so this too, bringing these ideas together, helps to take forward Marcus's core project in the work of ethical self-development understood in Stoic terms. So far, I have stressed the extent to which the meditations reflect Stoic doctrines. So it may seem puzzling why scholars have thought, as they have thought, that Marcus was eclectic or amateurish in his approach. To some extent, this view of Marcus as amateurish stems, I think, from failing to engage fully with the aims and idiom of the meditations. But there are undoubtedly some apparently non-standard features in Marcus's work which need to be recognised and explained. And I'll turn to those now. Two points especially stand out. One is that the meditations sometimes, though not always, distinguish reason from emotion and the mind or soul, psyche, in a way that evokes a platonic picture of human psychology rather than the stoic, unified or holistic one. A second point is this. The meditations sometimes use language which suggests that Marcus is unsure whether the Stoic providential worldview, which he normally assumes, is the true one, or rather the competing Epicurean one, according to which the universe is a fortuitous collection of atoms. Although this is not the place for a full treatment of these puzzles, some brief points can be made in explanation of these features. In the first feature on psychology, I think that Marcus is using Platonizing language to express a thoroughly stoic idea, namely that human beings are fundamentally rational and that the best use of this rationality is to develop ethically. So, although the style of expression is unorthodox, the underlying content is not. 
The second feature is more puzzling, but not as puzzling as is sometimes suggested. Often, Marcus only poses the alternative, providence or atoms, as he often puts it, in order to reaffirm the stoic providential worldview. So the opposition is, in a way, rhetorical, because he always comes out in favour of um, providence. In a few cases, between three or five, depending on how precisely one interprets the passages, Marcus leaves the question open. But even in those cases, Marcus makes it plain that he has no doubt about the truth of Stoic ethical principles. Elsewhere, Marcus acknowledges that Stoic ethics are at the very centre of his concerns, and that his grasp of other aspects of Stoic theory is less secure. This feature of his writings seems to reflect a degree of uncertainty in this respect. Although in general, as I've said, Marcus adopts quite standard views on the interface between ethics and physics in Stoicism. Overall, I think one should not overstate these aspects of the meditation, which are exceptional in a work and project which is otherwise thoroughly Stoic and which helps us understand Stoicism better.